you can just, uh, Friday night comes around, you can think on it, so take your notes and whatnot. So, so amen. So, amen. So, what is the theme of James? Shut your mouth. <laughs> Shut your mouth. That's <laughs> 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 oh, part of it, yep. So what, what would be a good, that's, that's some of it, what would be, uh, if we were to sum up the whole book of James, what would we, would we sum up? I mean, yes, we've got about the tongue, we've got about other things, um, you know. Be attention, be endures of the word. But what, what, we could, what could sum up the whole book of James? Well, what are what are the, some the key things we've talked about? You know, shutting your mouth sometimes, the tongue, making sure the tongue is right because it's sometimes it's bitter, it can it can pour forth blessings and cursings. Faith. Hmm? Faith. 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 What else? In the first three chapters that we've looked at, we've got being doers of the word. All right. Don't be flip flopping. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. First chapter there. The difference between believing in God and believing on God. The difference between believing in God and believing on God. Okay, so we've got faith. What about works by faith? Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Mm -hmm. So good works shows forth our faith. Mm -hmm. So really, if we put it all together, we've got a book to keep our testimony, our conversation. By the way, that as the Bible says, the word conversation, not as in. Are, are speaking to each other. Conversation is the way we live our life. Right. Really, the whole essence of the book of James is, is to measure up our testimony, our conversation, the way we live, to bridle our tongue, to keep our body in our subjection, to do good works, to show forth our faith by good works, to not be unstable, how we think, how we act, how we speak, what we do. This is the whole theme of James. Is, is giving the Christian the, the if you like, the, the bullet points mm -hmm. on our daily lives and how we are to look at these things. You know, even, even in, in chapter 3, when he talks about being not many masters, you know, don't put yourself out of where you shouldn't be in that way. And um, about wisdom, you know, having godly wisdom and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace. Of them that make peace we talked about that you don't sow seed on a war zone you know on Flanders field if per se if we take that for example you didn't see the French farmers out there sowing sowing seeds while the uh, Germans and the Allied forces were, were shooting each other you know that just wouldn't have made any sense um, but it did it, it do it in peace okay so anyway let's look at chapter 4 but let's pray before we go on Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we come in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your goodness and for your blessings and for all you've done for us. We pray that you bless this, uh, your reading, the reading of your word, and uh, pray that you give us all the strength that we need uh, to do for you what we can. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Also pray for me. Um, I have a hard to understand today. Okay. So he says in verse, uh, verse 1, it says, From whence cometh wars and fightings among you? Come ye not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your own lusts. So right away we get into another portion of our daily lives. We get into another part of our, our, our conversation, our testimony, how we should live. You know, because then he's saying this is where the wars and things come from, from your lusts. So we've looked at a lot of, we've looked at um, some mental things and being unstable. We've looked at physical things like the tongue and good works by faith. Now we're looking at really into the spiritual side, into emotions, into our will is where we're getting into now. This is, this is where if you think of our, you know, our soul as our mind, our will and our emotions. Uh, you know, we can see that from the scriptures, uh, how these things, these things come about. And we see how each one of these takes its shape um, from, the, from each part of the Trinity. You know, our, our will is to do that of the Father. You know, our, our um, mind is to be the mind of Christ, the Bible says. We're to have the mind of Christ. And the fruit of the Spirit is emotions. 
and how our emotions come out, the love, joy, peace. These are all emotional things, states of being. And so right here, he's hitting with lust. He said, you lust and have not. Now, I'm not just talking about sexual lust. Uh, because when we mention lust, that's the only thing we go to is talk about sexual lust, which is the pr prevalent of the lusts. But really, there's a lust um, of anything, of lusting to have something, whether it be food, whether it be another person, whether it be car, money, cars, money, clothes, whatever it is, these things are lustful. And you lust and have not, you kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. So what God's saying is, have you ever asked me for these things? A lot of people are doing all this stuff to try and to, to get these things that they need, um, you know, to, to warring and fighting and, and all these things and desiring and lusting after these things, but they've never asked God, right? One thing that we need to do, notice, though, is when he says in verse 3, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. Mm -hmm. So some people do ask, but they ask the wrong things. They ask God for it, but they never veto it through the Holy Spirit. When we need something from the Lord, God says he's going to supply our needs. Right. right? Mm -hmm. But if we're walking according to the Spirit and doing God's will, he will bring that in. Oftentimes, we don't even have to ask for these things. God knows what we need, and he'll bring it in. You know, but it is nice to ask him and certainly yeah. thank him yeah. for it. Yeah. You know, when you know something is coming up, you say, Lord, you know, this is what I need. And go and trust that God will bring it in. And he does every time. Yeah. You know, the, you know, I mentioned Friday night about our car and um, needing the money for it. It's already paid for, basically. Um, you know, it came in Saturday morning. Yeah. So it's already done and dusted. Um, you know, it's God, God does these things yeah. when we need it. You know, uh, so praise the Lord for it, how he, he works that way. You know, we just ask God these for these things. But if we then turned around and said we wanted a brand new jag, um, you know, well, that's that's consuming upon our own lusts. What do we need that for? You know, so we, we, we need to make sure that when we're asking for something, we veto it through the Holy Spirit. Let me give you an example. Right. Uh, I think I've given you this example before, but it's good to remind you again. Right, say, for example, you say to the Lord, and it's winter time, say, I, Lord, I need a, uh, or you write down a list. You say, I need a hat, a coat, and a good pair of winter boots. Mm -hmm. right? And um, you go to the Holy Spirit and say, okay, what, what do, and you ask the Holy Spirit to lead you through this list that you're going to pray for before you go to the Father. And, um, you know, you say, you know, say, right, I'm wanting Armani shoes. I'm wanting, I don't even know any other brands, really. Uh, you know, whatever top brand coat or these kind of things, Jordan would know better than I would, but um, whatever it would be. And the Holy Spirit says, what do you need that for? You know, so here's a good pair of boots from Primark and here's this and whatever else. And it says, okay, fair enough. That's, that's what we'll ask for. And so you go to then, then, then you, you veto, the Holy Spirit has vetoed that list and said, this is what you need. Yes, that's what you want, but this is what you need. And so you go to the Father and say, you know, um, Lord, I need I need a new hat and I need a new I need a new coat, mm -hmm. and you forget about the boots. Well, this is where the Holy Spirit steps in and says, you know, Father, He also needs that. You know, for He prays for us in this because if we forget it, He steps in in that way and prays for us and these things. So, and then the Lord blesses us with what we need. But we always have to give God veto power. You know, a lot of times people just go to the Lord and just you know just spew out on Him all the things that they want. Instead of taking time to say, Holy Spirit, what do I, should I pray for? Because if we do that, then we know that we're asking according to God's will. But if we don't do that, then we can be asking against the Lord's will and praying for things that are not according to God's will. And then we say, well, why is God not answering that request? Because it wasn't according to what he, he wanted. So when we pray in the Holy Spirit, we can pray believing that God is going to do exactly as what we prayed for because we've been led of the Holy Spirit to pray for these things. And so we, we understand as well when Jesus said, when you go to the feasts, don't pick the high seat, most important seat, for them to be moved down. As somebody more important comes in, you get moved down. Somebody then not as important as the first guy, and then you get moved down, and then you get moved down. And so you get moved down. And what, how embarrassing that is. But pick the lower seat, and then you'll be exalted to the higher ones. The one thing that really bothers, bugs me, is when I um, visit in other churches and they've got the big, the big podiums and all the big high stages and stuff. You know, they want everybody to sit up on the platform, and it's just, you know, I, I just don't like 
sitting up on the platform. I just, I, I'm okay behind, once I get behind the pulpit, but I'd rather sit on the front row and come up rather than sit there. For, you know, <laughs> I just don't like doing that. But, you know, I always try and get away with it. Uh, but then the preacher would come on, come on. I'm like, no, I don't want to sit there. You know, cause, but then I just have some fun while I'm up there, especially in, in uh, certain churches. You know, you make faces. But <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, I don't like, uh, but I would never, you know, go up and sit there and for them say, what are you doing? You know, uh, I'd rather sit in the front row and say, if they want me to go and sit up there, okay, fair enough. Um, you know, it just, it, it kind of, it, it's, uh, I, I can understand out of convenience because then you're straight to the pulpit. But um, it's like sitting here, I wouldn't like, you know, don't, uh, but anyway, that's beside the point. Um, I don't know where that came from. But anyway, um, you know, if we're, if we're, we do the same thing in our prayers as we ask for what we need, God oftentimes blesses us with more than what we need. If we ask for the, just the regular thing, God may give us even over above what we do. Now, there's no reason why we can't be specific about our, our requests. You know, if you need a hat and you want a black one, ask for a black hat. If you want a red one, ask for a red hat. You know, in this way, there's no reason to being specific. But don't get bogged down that if you wanted, you know, a hundred pound hat and God gives you one for a fiver. Well, I want this one. Or, you know, somebody gets, I've seen the video of somebody getting an iPod or an iPod, whatever iPhone it was uh, for their birthday. And they went mental because it was a white one and not a black one. Wow. I mean, it was all the rest of it, but they absolutely went mental. It's like, okay, whatever. Talk about lust. You know, it says, you ask amiss and receive not because you ask, it, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your own lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be friend of the world is the enemy of God. So again, we're, we're getting into our emotions. Our emotions attached to the world, how the world makes us feel, or how God makes us feel. Are we entertained or do we entertain the world? Or do we entertain, excuse me, God? And the adulterers and adulteresses is not necessarily in a sexual context. Okay, it's really not. Because in the whole, the, the context of that, um, that scripture is being friendly with the world, but, but committing spiritual adultery. Because being part of God's church, being, part, being selected for the bride of Christ, but then committing adultery, with another church, a church that is not of God, or something that's not of God, going whoring after all these other religions or all these other things. That's what he's really talking about, being an adulterer and adulteresses. And he says, friendship with the world is enmity with God. You know, and, and this is really important that we understand what he's talking about in this, in this section, that he's, he, he is really making the point of that, um, that there is spiritual adultery you know there is spiritual adultery and the bible talks about it it talks about um you know committing adultery with the great whore mm -hmm. what is the great whore it, well, predominantly the catholic church the latin church the the the, the church that's come out of babylon uh, there was a church in babylon a new testament church in babylon but um but we're talking about the babylonian religion the babylon religion that came out of there that, that you know amalgamated uh, or formed into the Catholic Church as it is today uh, with through various things so if we are then fornicating if you like with the Catholic with the whore or the daughters of the whore we're committing spiritual adultery against God God started a specific church you know if you want to really t trace the roots back you trace the roots back to Abraham when he made covenant with Abraham right and then from there, I'm not talking about um, um, the spiritual Israel or, or um, what's the word they call it? Um, oh, replacement theology. God did not replace Israel with a church, right? Basically grafted into that. So all God's people are, or those are saved, if you like. But we do see that there's a difference between the saved and the church. We really do see that. Uh, there's evidently a difference there. Um, you know, to be saved is to be one, it was one thing, but we must be baptized to be added unto the church. Yeah. And we can see that through scripture. And from that, from the faithful of that, uh, God will select the bride for his son. So if we are betrothed to Christ, 
Why should we then be committing adultery with another Jesus, another spirit, or another gospel, or another church? We shouldn't. But yet so many people do because they bring in their holidays, they bring in their rites and rituals, or they bring in all kinds of false doctrine, especially from the Word of Faith movement. So much of that is coming into Baptist churches. Uh, when you go back 200 years ago and you find that they were still, you know, solid. Many of the churches were still solid in their doctrine. But it's in the last 150 years that, that, that the Baptist churches have really been polluted and perverted. And today they believe it. They think that you're nuts because you speak out against it. But the thing is, that they're the ones that have, have accepted this false doctrine. You know, I'm very thankful for folks that, that understood that, and, and I've got several friends on Facebook that are independent fundamental Baptists and believe just as we do, uh, because they, they, they know, or they've been even been raised in the old paths because their church never, um, never did commit fornication with Babylon. And I'm very, praise the Lord for churches that have never been polluted. Amen. Amen. But if we're friendly with the world, we're, we're the enemy of God. We cannot be both. We cannot serve the world through our emotions or let the world dictate our emotions. And then also, uh, on this other hand, try and please God. It just won't work. He says, do you think, in verse 5, do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Now, here's an example of something we were talking this morning about when people quote the scriptures, but it's not there. Would you agree that James is scripture? Yes, it's inspired of God. Yes. However, we don't find this in the Old Testament, uh, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. We don't find that. It's not there. Okay. So we have, we have several people issues here. Um, some people say there's two separate parts. Some say that, uh, do you think that the scripture speaks in vain? And then they put a period there. The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy. So they think that that should be two separate sentences. Others say, well, he's referring to an apocryphal book. So he could be, like we were talking this morning, it might have been said in Scripture. But um, the problem is that in Old Testament, they didn't really understand the Holy Spirit. But I think what he's really saying is he's summing up what the Scripture is speaking of. It may not be word for word verbatim of what's been said, but the essence is there. We do find the filling of the Spirit was certainly all through the Old Testament. You know, Moses even said, I wish that everybody was filled with the Spirit. You know, even David prayed, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. So they understood that there was a Holy Spirit. They understood that he was in them. So they understood the concept, but I really don't think they understood everything the Holy Spirit was until way after Pentecost until the Holy Spirit, the power was laid out and he was available to every person to be filled with the Spirit. I do believe, though, that every person that's ever been saved was indwelt with the Spirit, you know, because we I really cannot go along with the fact that saying that, because that, um, a lot of people still believe that you can lose your salvation. Well, if it's yours, obviously you can, but if it's God's, you can't, you know. And um, so to say that... Um, that, that, that you, that, you know, because we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. So it means if the people in the Old Testament weren't sealed with the Holy Spirit, it means they could lose their salvation. To, uh, to, uh, you, then you start going into dispensations where God dealt with different people at different ways. Because God does not change. You know, we really, there's only two different things that we have is we have an old covenant and we, or a first covenant, we have a second covenant. You know, there's some differences under there. Yes, there's some different ages. If you like, there was an age where there was innocence. And then, of course, man sinned. You know, how long was that for? And then these kind of things. But, but um, to say that God deals with us in different ways is, is nonsense. Because God has always required blood as a sacrifice for sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. God has always said these things. Even when Adam and Eve sinned, he slain an animal to atone for their sins. You know, and to see what Christ was going to do as the part one and perfect sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But so we really see that, that um, if you like, that this is, is, is um, a summary. The spirit that dwelt in us lusteth to envy. And uh, so we, we kind of get that from the, the, um, the, 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 the context there. 
Um, so and then he says, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Well, we know this from Noah as well, because it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. All right, so we know that Noah was a humble man in this. Then he comes on to a very, very important couple of verses. He says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double minded. So this is really important scripture uh, in dealing with spiritual warfare in our submission, right? Uh, if we are submitted to God uh, in this way, we're yielded to him. We've yielded our lives, our mind, our will, and emotions, our bodies. Everything we have is yielded to God to do as he would have. Because he's told us already that if we're friendly with the world, with the world's music, the world's movies, all these kind of things, if we're friendly with that, we cannot be the friend of God. You know, or we get into the Lua de Seen point, but we're lukewarm in that instance, right? And God says he'll spew us out of your mouth. So we, we can't look at these. But then he says, submit yourselves therefore to God. So that's the first point, is submission. Mm -hmm. Giving to God everything. Then he says, then resist the devil and he will flee from you, right? If you're, enemy to, if you're friendly with the world, you've already submitted basically to the devil. Why would he flee from you? Why do you think he would flee from you? When you have got, he's already your friend. He's al you're already under his control. Why would he flee away from you when he's already got you? Hmm? He's already holding on to you. So he's not going to flee from you. Why? Because you're not submitted to God. Just saying. If we look at these things, we have to take it in order. Remember the script, let all things be done decently and in order? If we look at the order, the specific chronology of this, the first thing is, is humility. The second thing is submission. And the third thing is resist, is to fight. And resist doesn't mean to cower behind and hope he'll go away. Resist is to fight. So when he comes, we fight. Right? Attack is something different. There's no command in the scriptures to attack the devil. None whatsoever. If you find one, please let me know. But I don't find it. I find we defend ourselves and we resist when he attacks us. We have the authority to resist when he attacks. We do not have the authority to take the attack to him. All right, so we've got to be careful in picking our spiritual battles because we oftentimes, a lot of people pick battles that are not their own. Like the men that went up to Ai. They had never consulted God. They took on a battle that was not theirs and they got gubbed. But to, had they prayed about it, they would have realized that there was sin in the camp. So oftentimes we take on a battle that is not ours because, and we get gubbed because there's a sin in the camp or there's something. We're friendly with the world. We're too friendly with the world and we haven't completely submitted to God. Right? So that's the first thing there is submission. is well, humility, then submission, and then fighting against the devil. Uh, and he will flee from you. And it's literally, as I've, I've preached, you know, we've got about two hour teaching on this subject about our personal enemy, uh, that we are, it's a personal thing. And we can tell him, we have the authority to tell the devil, say, hey, Satan, get away from me in the name of Jesus and quote scripture. Do exactly what Jesus did. You know, if you think you're better than Jesus, well, okay then. But, um, you know, Jesus used that same example and he told him to go and he quoted scripture. Obviously, he didn't have to use his own name. Uh, because he had the authority in his voice. But we as Christians only have the power through the name of Jesus. So devil in the name of Jesus, get thee hence, for it is written. Be ye holy, for I am holy. Okay. Draw nigh to God, and he draw, will draw nigh to you. The more we get closer to God, the more God's going to pull us closer to him. Right? God doesn't expect us to come the whole way. We come a little bit, he comes a little bit. We come a whole lot, he comes a whole lot. You know, it's like this, coming together, you know. It's almost like stretching out the hand. You know, you, as you go, you don't, you don't see somebody, you know, go out like that and the other person doesn't, doesn't do it. You know, when, when you go to shake somebody's hand, I mean, you've obviously got several different handshakes. You've got the, the towny handshake, which is, is here. You know, the people come right up together. You've got the kind of village handshake. And then you've got the, 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 the um, if you like, out of towners, you know, that kind of do this. They lean over uh, like that. It's a big, big 
you know, like that, because of their personal space. They're used to being out in mm -hmm. the farm, and so they, they reach out like that. But if, if you've got somebody that reaches out like that, and they are further and standing like that, you're going to have a wee problem, you know, if he's not going to reach out, he's going to cope over. So draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to us. Uh, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. So again, he goes back to the double-mindedness uh, to get these things. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Why would he do this? Because these are almost negative emotions, weren't they? Why is he saying this? He's not telling us to be sad. He's telling us to contemplate what we're doing. To get a hold of what sin is. To see sin as exceedingly sinful. Because until we see sin as sinful, we will never get rid of it. If we continually uh, do the same thing, thinking that God is okay with this, we're never going to see it as sin. But when we see sin as sin, then we can do something about it. Until we're sick of that sin, we're not going to give it up. As long as we have deceived ourselves, and this can be anything that we can deceive ourselves by, you know, mm -hmm. as long as we continually deceive ourselves thinking we're doing okay, we're, we're, we're never going to get it right. We're never going to get rid of it. We're never going to be able to, to get on top of it. We're never going to be able to tell the devil to flee yeah. because we're not going to see it. So be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Let us really get, you know, with contrition and see our sin as exceedingly sinful. And see this worldly joy, this worldly things that happen, let that be turned to mourning because we have allowed the world to, to give us the joy. We've allowed the world to give us the happiness. We've allowed the world to make us comfortable. Let that be turned to mourning that we can mourn and weep and say, oh God, forgive us. For being friends of the world. But until we see that as sin, we're not going to be able to, to get on board with God as much as we can. He says in verse 10, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. It's echoing the words of Jesus. He that exalted himself shall be abased, but he that abased himself shall be, he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Just the whole essence of, again, of this about taking the lower seats rather than the higher seats. Mm -hmm. Humility doesn't mean say, oh God, I'm nothing. That's not humility. Humility is raising someone else up. It is not self-degrading. Right. Right? right? When you see David humbling himself, what is he doing? Praising God. That's how David humbled himself, not by saying, oh God, I'm a worm, I'm dust, I'm nothing, I'm useless. That's not how he did it. He did it by praising God, by lifting his name up on high. And that is how we humble ourselves, by lifting God, by praising God, by lifting him up above all other names. And he humbles ourselves. But God in turn will lift us up by our praise. Because if we sit there and we, we rag on ourselves and we say we're nothing and useless in this, what are we doing? We're ragging on God's creation. We are made in the image of God. And so when we start degrading ourselves and telling God that we're useless, we're telling God he made a mistake, that he didn't do a good job. Now, sure, yes, we're sinners because we have sinned. Right? We can say that. God forgive me a sinner. Sure. But then, or Paul says, I'm the chiefest of sinners. You know, that's stating a fact. That is, not, that is not saying, that's just recognizing what we are, that we are human. That we fail as humans. But to say that we are just whatever, you know, the Bible talks about the heart is deceitfully wicked. And we understand where we, where we are. But yet, God said we're more important than the sparrows. Or any of the birds. God says we're more important than any other creature on the planet. God did not send his son to die for the eagles or the lions or the whales. Yet everybody saved the whales. Yeah. Save the lepers. Leopards. Is 
Sorry, private joke. Anyway. <laughs> You know, all these, all these things. You know, everybody wants to save, save the trees, save the whales, all this. What about save the people? I mean, people by the thousands pour money into Greenpeace to save the whales or save the dogs or the cats or the hamsters or the fleas or whatever it is they're saving these days or save the haggis.com. <laughs> But what about save the people? You'll get people knocking on our doors. Oh, would you pledge ten pounds a month to save the whale? As how does a whale get saved? With a heart man believeth unto righteousness. It doesn't say with a heart a whale believeth unto righteousness. No, no, no. What about saving the people? But again, this shows where our friendship with the world is that we, we are worshipping the, cre the creature, the creation, more than the creator. Right. That we're too busy about the whales or the trees. Now, yes, we should be concerned with our planet. God put us here to tend it, to take care of it. We should not destroy it. But then again, we shouldn't, we shouldn't be placing a whale's life over and above the life of a human being, or especially the salvation of a human being. That has got to be our most important thing. So that depends how we look on things. Are we looking at it from a world's point of view? Or are we looking at it from God's point of view? Especially when we see, star you see starving children, but yet they want to save the whales. You know? I remember walking into Tesco and this guy was collecting um, for some kind of shelter thing, some battered dogs thing. And I was like, yeah, we, we shouldn't beat dogs. But at the end of the day, they're dogs. But then just, you know, at the same time, where there was a big flood, I can't remember where it was, down, down south somewhere. And people were without power, without homes, people were, were dead, people were in hospital, had nothing. You know, and I, I said that to him. I said, well, that's not my job. You know, I said, well, I'm not being funny, but do you think that your dogs are more important than these people? Well, well, well no, but I said, well, then I'm not going to give to your, your thing, am I? But yet we have in this day and age this idea that animals and all these things are more important than humans. And we seem to miss out on that fact. Speak not evil, in verse 11, it says, Speak not evil one against one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Okay. Now this is, again, people often try to take this out of context with, um, with Matthew 7, I believe it is, judge not that you be not judged. But you need to read the rest of the passage on that. It's not talking about not bringing judgment. This is really speaking about, um, about condemnation because God is the lawgiver, right? We don't condemn someone in that sense. But what we can do is we can have righteous judgment, as the Bible says, to see that this person is doing wrong. Else, how are we to exercise church discipline? Right, if we are not to judge at all, how do we exercise church discipline? How do we look and say, okay, this person's committing adultery, therefore they need to go under church discipline? If that is true, if, if we're not to judge, then how is Paul to tell them to give, deliver one over to Satan? Yeah, we can't. We, we cannot pick and choose where we judge. We can't say it's okay to judge in this context, but it's not okay to judge in that context. In a sense, what we really need to say is, okay, we see that as sin, according to the law, according to what God says in black and white. You're doing that, therefore you're contravening the law. I am not judging. I am seeing what the law says. I see what you're doing is opposite to the law. Therefore, I can put two and two together. I have not judged. I have merely pointed out that what you're doing is against the law. Right? It's the same with a cop. Right? Whenever we pulled over somebody for speeding, or we said you're under arrest for, we did not judge them for that. We merely saw that they were committing offense that we have been told, according to the law, is wrong. Therefore, you are arrested for that purpose. It is not us then to judge. They go before a judge to plead their case. We merely see that they have committed a crime 
and therefore we arrested them for it. Right? In the sense of God has written the law and he is the one that will judge. He knows the intents of the heart. He knows what is going on. We cannot judge the heart. We cannot judge the emotions. But we can look at someone and say, you know, you're stealing. That's against God's law. Lying is against God's law. Or you're judging me. No. Did you lie? Oh, yes, I lied. Does God say it's against the Bible? Yes, it is. So therefore, what's, the, what's to judge in that situation? Is there any judgment needed? No, because it's in black and white. God says, thus saith the Lord. Therefore, there's really no judgment needed. Just an interpretation saying, okay, the Bible says that's wrong. You're doing that here. What God says is wrong. I don't need to judge. I can just look at the scriptures. And I know. And it goes for myself too. If we're doing something, if I'm doing something, you're doing something, and you see it in the scripture, you can say, oh, wait a minute. What I'm doing is wrong. I need to change that. Or I look at the scriptures and say, I'm not doing something that I'm supposed to be doing. And that is it. And then 13, he says, Go to now that ye say, tomorrow, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So again, when making decisions and things, we are, we're making decisions according to the Holy Spirit, how he leads us. But we do say, God willing, and I say that all day, God willing, this is what we'll do. You know, and God willing, this is what will get done. And God willing, we'll be leaving tomorrow uh, to go down south. You know, but uh, we always have to be aware of God changing plans. Because sometimes these things happen, some things come up. You know, I hope it doesn't. You know, but sometimes God delays us for a purpose. I would rather be delayed for half an hour than end up in a car accident. It's that simple, you see. But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. This is all these boastings, what we're saying we're doing, what we're, you know, because a lot of people are saying, oh, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this, we're doing that. So this is just boasting. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. All right. Mm -hmm. So, again, this really is a trump card for a lot of things. You know, when we know to do good, we need to look in and say, if we don't, it is evil. If we know that we need to do something and do not do it, we have sinned not only against God, but against the person to whom we should have done it. Because either we have, um, we have um, um, not defrauded, we have, um, oh, what's the word? Uh, we're neglected, not neglected either, kind of neglected. We, um, we have, um, oh, I can't think of the word just now. Um, the word starts with D. Um, we basically have, have not allowed them to get what um, the, the, they should have gotten. I can't think of what the word is just now. Um, what? No, no. Um, um, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, we have we have not allowed them um, to. It's right there, but uh, they they should have gotten something, and we stopped them from getting it because we didn't give it to them. You know, and, and and that's it. You know, I think back of George Mueller, who never asked man for anything, but just relied on God. He prayed to God, and God brought it. And I wondered why. Because I tried it, and I tried to say, I said, okay, God, this is what I need in this way. And, you know, things weren't coming in. And then I did mention it, and, you know, things started coming in to people. I'm thinking, well, why, God? Because I truly believed you would do that. And God said, it's not your faith. It's that people aren't listening. You know? It's not our faith. It's that in George Mueller's time, people were listening to God. When God spoke to them, you need to do this, they did it. Today, they're not listening. People have to have, this is what we need. People in today's churches do not tend to sing and say, God, what do we need to do to send to such and such? Or, you know, or God brings a person and says, oh, what, do they need something? 
and just rely on God to say to send it to them say God told me to send you this we've forgotten that tact we've forgotten that we've forgotten how to do that so and I think there's a lot of people that God says hey you need to send this to such and such and they've completely ignored it or they didn't even hear it so well you know if they need something they'll ask for it you have not because you ask not that's what you usually hear but asking God and asking a person are two different things I can ask somebody for something and out of the goodness of the heart they would probably give it to me but was that God's will for them to provide that need? You know? That's the thing. Was it God's will there or was somebody else going to provide that need? Or was it something that I didn't need that I was just asking amiss? So it's often best if we ask God for these things. So they're not robbing somebody of a blessing or denying someone um, the, the goodness, the blessings that they, they need. You know, to him, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him to sin. So we know it's good to do good. We know God has told us to do good. We need to look at that and see that. But again, according to what God has said, we don't just, just give because somebody asks us. We give because God has told us and said, do this, do that. That is what we need to make sure. That is what we need to make sure. And do good. But also be wary. Be wary. Always, always go in the spirit of the Lord and make sure it's the right spirit. Whatever we do in our conversation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you today, we come in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your goodness and for your blessings. We pray that you'd help our conversation to be true and, and that others would see our lives and uh, see Jesus in us <clears throat> and come to the knowledge of the Savior uh, through our testimony, through what we say, and uh, through our good works they might show forth Christ. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We pray you be with us, bless as we travel home and be with us as we, as we go away and, and pray. Uh, for good services next week too. We thank you, Lord. We love you. Praise in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. 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 You are dismissed. <laughs>